I want to um, uh, wind some down here with um, you know a discussion of burial because this is Egypt. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about dead people in ancient Egypt, because you know, tombs and all that, pyramids and business. So we're going to get the process started by pointing to the Masaba as a structure. And Mastaba can be made in a, in a few different ways. The key to all of them is that the actual burial is underground. There's always a, a shaft that goes down into the bedrock, so it's carved down like you're carving into the stone, and you're carving out a room and you bury something there. But then as you go up that shaft and you want to seal it up, you build a, something on top of it. There's a structure over the top of it that protects it. So that's basically just a giant pile of, of my bricks. It's not a building, per se. It covers the shaft that goes down to the grave. Does that sound familiar as, a, as an idea so far? Does that sound like anything we've looked at so far in the class? Giant structure, big little rectangular structure, pile of mud bricks. Yeah, the, the beginnings of the ziggurats, the first stage is the raised platform upon which I'm going to put the, 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 the temple house, right? And then I make the platform a little bit bigger, and I put the little temple up on top of that. It's different because this isn't a temple, right? And the tomb is underground, but it's similar in that it's just a large pile of bricks, and then they get bigger. And over time, the kings want more and more elaborate masada. And eventually, they go from being mud brick, because you start off like, you know, just these big mud brick rectangles, and they start saying, you know, stone is a lot cooler, stone lasts forever, let's carve stone to do this. And they start building stone mastaba. And you can see what that's going to eventually lead to, right? Once you know how to do that, hey, why not make a pyramid? Um, I know, like, they're built in different areas, but do people ever think, because these look kind of similar to the ziggurats, do people ever think that there's possibly burials under ziggurats or not? Um, we, we, we do know, in fact, that there isn't, but people did wonder. I mean, it's, it's always possible. You know, they could have different functions. Um, we, we can tell from the, the structures and the long study of them that they have completely different uses. And in all likelihood, the, the appearance, <coughs> the, the way they build up, is coincidental. That it just makes sense to pile bricks. Right? And we don't really know how to make a good building, per se, out of that, but it's just a big, sturdy pile of these things. But the one is intended to elevate you above and we have God's house up there, and the other is simply to cover and protect a permanent location that no one is going to touch. Okay? So they, they actually reflect some very different cultural ideals too. The Egyptians really value permanence. So they want, they want to put you down on the ground here so you're perfectly safe and no one will ever touch that body. And these suits will be covered up. But yeah, they, they kind of start off, and you can see how some of them are wearing down over time because you know, these are, again, they're mud bricks. Right. Or you start building some out of stone much later. Right. These are a bit more sturdy. You guys have probably heard this term for an Egyptian king before at some point. Right. We're familiar with what a pharaoh is, right. at least maybe in broad outline. The term comes to us in English from Greek, so it's not a Kemetic term initially. It's not an Egyptian term. Uh, but the concept is quite distinct. We have to get a handle on that and how distinct that is from our Mesopotamian kings. What are our early Mesopotamian kings? What's the term we use for them? What kind of kingship do they have? Sacro kingship, which is what? Priests. Yeah, high priests. And that evolves into heroic kingship. What's the difference with, let me be more quiet, what's heroic kingship? I just trying to do it on Friday. Was it like that their stories and their deeds of being a hero kind of rose them to that king status and made them able to be followed? Perfect. They're, own, they're, they're king by their own actions. Right? So often that means I'm king by right of conquest. I defeated your king, your king sucks, ergo I'm king. Right? But in general it means your own heroic deeds. Something about you makes you deserve the kingship rather than being from a line of high priests and trained as a high priest. Kingship in Egypt is completely different from both. It has no similarity to either of them. They are literally God kings. Uh, so they are understood to be living gods, and as a consequence, um, incest is super common in ancient Egypt because they want to keep that pure bloodline descended from the gods within it, which is one of the reasons that many of the royal families all die out and get replaced because you can only intermarry for so many generations before you end up getting and then it's a bit problematic, so lines frequently die out. So 
Um, so there's a, a kind of, it's, it's sort of sad in a way, right? But um, it is understandable given this idea of a divine blood lineage. And it's connected to their understanding of the gods, because the gods themselves uh, are siblings. The Egyptian gods all come in pairs, male and female, who are both spouses and siblings. And they always deal with like related a attributes, so they're always in pairs there. So, so they're basically extending the same concept into the royal families. Who are so far? They're understood to be living gods, and their godhood continues after their death. As long as the priestly cult survives and continues to give the particular offerings to the, the spirit of that pharaoh, that pharaoh continues to exist as a deity for them. Cool. Um, this is going to mean that you don't have to develop the same kinds of legal customs that we see in Mesopotamia. Big formal law codes don't make as much sense for Egypt. Because the next ruler is going to be a god, and he might choose different rules. You know, he might want to change things. So there's that, right? So they don't see a real reason to do it. The other reason they don't see a need to do it is that Egypt is so tightly constrained by tradition. It is an extremely conservative culture that just does not change much. Um, and I'll give you a whole bunch of examples of that in uh, the coming weeks here as we're dealing with, uh, with Egypt, ways in which they do remain relatively static and value kind of like permanence for 3,000 years. But um, the combination of tradition and the godlike stature does actually stop the development of formal law codes that we see in Mesopotamia. Um, but given their superpowers, they're basically taking credit for how good life is. Remember our discussion of the Nile last time, right? The Nile floods like clockwork every year, bringing in good rich silts, making it extremely extremely productive agricultural land without all the downsides of flooding normally because you know when it's going to happen and you're not going to be in its path, right? So it's an extremely easy place to live. And the pharaohs are like, yeah, that's, that's because of me. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I am making the Nile do it. And that works, right? But the downside of that is when things go badly, they'll be blamed for them too. Right, so we'll give you an example of that. This one all right, so um, we want to make a distinction here. We're talking about the Old Kingdom only today. And we want to make sure we understand that the power of pharaohs is going to vary a bit over time. They will always be god kings. That'll be true all the way through the Greek Ptolemaic period. So Cleopatra VII was a goddess. Right? This concept does not go away, but people stop thinking of it as perfectly absolute. You know, as being able to do anything at all. There's a certain skepticism that comes in about their abilities later. So, in the Old Kingdom, pharaohs are the most powerful. And over time, their power gets watered down a little bit by increasing the power of the high priesthoods and the bureaucracy. Well, they're still gods, but they have to work with other people. Um, we do have social classes developing here, just as we saw anywhere else we settle. And a similar kind of breakdown happens, but it's a little different. Priests are not at the very top initially. Right? Our god kings are. And the power base of the god kings, the nobility and the warrior class. And one of the key reasons for this has to do with that agricultural land. Egypt produces such a bounty that you're actually able to hire professional soldiers much earlier and those soldiers become the basis of political order and stratification. Whereas in Mesopotamia, remember, we had what we call a temple economy, where the priests make the predictions and basically they start taking over the agriculture and running things, so the priesthood ends up on top. You see the, the distinction between the two of them here? It plays out a little bit differently. Um, but you end up then, you know, your priests and bureaucrats below that, then your basic middle class, your merchants and artisans, and then peasants at the bottom here. What's missing? A, yeah, I, I could have put merchants on there, but there's less trade early on. I, I lumped them in orally, largely because some of it does happen, but there's no long distance trade early on for Egypt. It's much more isolated, so the merchant class is, is like infinitesimally small. Um, we'll, put our, we'll, we'll draw our soldiers primarily out of here. That kind of fits there. What else is missing? Slaves. Slaves. Slaves is a big one, right? Um, there's no slaves here. Didn't slaves build the pyramids? No. 
slaves did not build pyramids. We want to really make sure we understand that here. Right? Um, Here's your basic breakdown. So merchants and craftsmen here, your scribes and you know, the your bureaucrats there, your soldiers and your, your nobil nobility up here. Right? So basically, again, this is a, the power base of the pharaoh ultimately. Right? And the priesthood is in some ways subservient to. Um, so um, here's a, sort of one of the neat examples I can give you about um, the permanence that Egyptians prize so much. Have anyone ever draw anything like this? You want to make a copy of drawings so you get your ruler out and you put a grid and then you draw a grid on another, another piece of paper and then you just draw like one box at a time. Because it's a lot harder for some of us to kind of like visualize things and get the lines just right. But if you like, you're only looking at one little piece at a time, you can duplicate something pretty well. Make sense? Uh, this takes a while to develop. What we end up happening is by the time you get into the Middle Kingdom period, this is how all the art is done. Because they want art to look exactly as it did throughout the Old Kingdom. And the new kingdom, they continue it. Art doesn't change in Egypt. It doesn't go through a lot of transformations. I can be one notable exception to that, but for the most part, in every dynasty, things work exactly the same way. It's literally paint by numbers. Uh, because they don't really respect innovation. It's not a dynamic civilization the same way Mesopotamia is. Um, everything that they do artistically, from the largest structures and temples all the way down to the smallest art objects are supposed to convey a sense of permanence to people. A sense that this is the perfect ideal world and nothing ever needs to change here. This is also one of the reasons that Egyptians never colonized places. Even when they fought other peoples and defeated them, they didn't stay. They said, y'all are not Be loyal now, and they went home. So they probably had to come back a few years later because you revolted and you had to go back and beat them up again. But then they just keep repeating that over and over again. They have no interest in settling elsewhere because the Nile is perfect. Life in Egypt is perfect and nothing should change for them. Go there. You want to keep that in mind as, a, as an ideal. From uh, early on, we can see some elements of the Egyptian understanding of life, death, and permanence. Um, showing up in the way they treat the rulers. Now, over time, we'll start to democratize a kind of afterlife for Egyptians. But that process doesn't really get going into the Middle Kingdom period. In the Old Kingdom period, it's primarily the elites who have good access to an afterlife. And that's what our, uh, our mastabas are about, those protected areas deep underground. They were down there so that no one could mess with them because that physical space was somehow connected to their afterlife in the first place. You have a kind of like extra dimensional existence continuing in that room. So you kind of like, oh, your spirit comes out, out of the grave, and oh, cool, they left me some honey. You know, get the honey in. And then it just refills permanently because you said the right rituals when you put the honey in in the first place. Does that make sense? So it'll last forever for them. But it's, their afterlife is kind of locked into that space. Right? And that's going to continue as an idea for quite some time for the Egyptians. So it builds up out of the Masabas, eventually you can start seeing that, you know, really applying later to like uh, the pyramids and the, uh, the wall bearings, you'll see people later, the, the carved in tombs, that sort of thing. Um, the earliest of Masabas we, we dealt with were men, again, clay. I pointed those, like they're basically mud brick. But they very quickly start working with stone. I, I've, always, I've always been impressed by Egyptian stonework especially as far back as the Old Kingdom. Because none of this involved metal, uh, metal tools. There were no metal tools involved. No, no hammers and chisels were used. And they didn't even have the freaking wheel to move stuff around. You ever see those like giant obelisks, like a giant stone thing, and they like carved all on the side. It's like kind of standing. You guys know what the Washington Monument is, right? Mm -hmm. The Washington Monument is intended to look like an Egyptian obelisk. Right? It's, just, it's just big. But it's, it's made out of blocks. It's, it's like a simple piece of stone. These were carved out of the side of a cliff face as a single piece of stone. And they were carved out by people with other rocks. You get a harder rock and you throw it at it and catch it. Bam, bam, bam. Over and over and over again. Isn't yeah, amazing? Can you imagine like all the, the dust in the air that you're like <coughs> dying down from? But, you know, but they managed to accomplish a great deal with just stone on stone work. And that takes us to the creation of the first pyramids. Because the pyramids all have to have stone blocks quarried out. And you have to quarry them out in exactly the right dimensions. 
they actually be able to like, you know, this block is exactly this shape, and you're literally carving it out of a cliffside right, with these stone tools, and then transporting them, either using barges and or dragging them across the sand on little sledges. So, yay. Um, the first pyramid, right, um, uh, what's sometimes called the Step Pyramid, that's right, Kara, um, built by Imhotep for, uh, for uh, Djoser, is um, basically stacked mastodas. You see? Low level, and then another one on top, and another one on top, and another one on top. That's really it. You know? I mean, you get to take the sand off, and then, and then you can really see it's just going up steps. Have we going so far? But, this, but the slightly sloped walls and this basic flat square sort of thing is just like a mastaba. Yeah. So Imhotep's brilliance was to say, why don't we stack them and go higher, and then come up with the, the ramp techniques to be able to carry the stones higher and higher as they go up which we took a long time to reverse engineer, figure out exactly how they did it, because again, no wheels, no cranes, no ropes, nothing like that, right? all pure human power. So, basic point about appearance. No aliens are necessary. The pyramids are actually extremely low-tech creations, and they are for putting dead people in them. Right? And for the most part, actually, below them. Most pyramids, the burial is not inside the pyramid at all. It's actually down in the bedrock, just like in a Masaba. Right? That's true for the vast majority of them. A few of the larger ones have little chambers inside because someone said, let's try that. And there's a you know, kind of interesting engineering. You try to like create a sort of like a very tiny interior room and shove the weight aside. Um, that's honestly the only complicated thing about pyramids at all. The way pyramids were done, the, the short short of this is you want to clear a flat space, right? Just nice, flat, perfectly level piece of ground, right? So, you keep chipping away at the ground with your stones until it looks smooth and you're not quite sure. So you pipe in a little bit of water from the Nile. And you leave the water in. Just put like an inch of water in it and you watch. Does the water pool on one side or the other? Does it move? Is it perfectly flat? That make sense? If it's not, pipe it back out. You do some more work and you bring the water back in. You just keep testing until you see if the water does not move at all and does not collect higher in one spot than another, you know it's perfectly level. Hey, right? That's pretty low tech, isn't it? And then you're just piling blocks. If anyone's ever played with Legos, you've got the basic concept. Stacking bricks, right? Piling up the blocks. That's literally all a pyramid is. They're not actually that complicated. Um, so they're done by ordinary people, and they're actually done by agricultural laborers. Remember, uh, life is too easy in Egypt. You throw the food out to grow, and it just grows. So most of the time, you don't have a lot of other occupations. We had to do tons of other stuff in Mesopotamia just to survive. All kinds of like, you know, uh, dredging the rivers to keep them from silting up too much, constantly building new earthworks and whatnot. You're, there's a ton of work that's involved here, right? You don't have that in Egypt. And a lot of construction is in stone, so it doesn't need to be repaired all the time like the mud brick stuff does. So tons of free time. Rather than just letting people sit around bored and get in fights and whatever here, you hire them and say, OK, um, I will give you a beer ration to work on the temple. I'll give you a beer ration to work on the pyramid. And that's that. And you have massive labor gangs. No slaves involved. Have you seen that movie, uh, Exodus, Gods and Kings? OK, good. It's pretty bad. <laughs> um, but I have to watch like any kind of remotely historical film just out of curiosity. But sometimes it takes me a while. Like I, I, I couldn't see it this time. I, I know it was going to be bad. So, so, I, so I got it afterwards. And I, I put the thing in, and I stopped it 30 seconds in. And it took me months to go back and try and watch it again because in the first little bit has a little bit of text on the screen. You know, like the, the white on black text they're introducing. And the Hebrew slaves were building pyramids. I'm like, ah! It's just, no Hebrews existed at all in the world yet. Right? The pyramids were thousands of years old before there were any Jews, and slaves didn't build pyramids. So, anyway. Um, that's basically how we're doing it. You've got a sledge, you lay down a little bit of sand, and a tiny amount of water, not much. You put too much water, it gets a little sludgy, or whatever, but a little bit, helps the sand be slippy, and you drag a sledge, no wheels, you're dragging a sledge, up the ramp with pure human power. We're not even using oxen or something to pull these things. Humans were pulling these blocks in place. Neat, hey, right? This is, this is possible. We've, we've actually you know, not only figured out how it could be done, we, we can see that it's done. Right? A lot of these things have been slowly reverse engineered over a long period of time by archaeologists working in the area. 
So building pyramids is not actually that difficult. It just takes a lot of time and effort. Ooh. Okay. Uh, but it is actually kind of impressive that humans are sort of like levering these things into place you know, without wheels or pulleys or anything else. Um, because they are all pretty heavy. So that's, that's kind of amazing. But it is all possible to do. And the blocks are carved such that they can fit together almost perfectly. So there's no mortar involved, no like cement or any the binding materials, it's just block on block, stacked. But carved such that they will fit together perfectly and stay in place. The um here you got um an attempt at a pyramid, that sort of fails. It doesn't look quite right, does it? But um by the way, um, you've got an attempt here that doesn't quite work out, but they're trying. And the, the key to this, the key to these experiments, and one of the reasons, again, it bugs me that people think like the aliens help people build pyramids. We have all the failures as they're working out how to do it. You can see the experiments. You go from that step structure, and they start carving stone so not perfectly square, they can like fit in to the, the little crevices there. And you start creating these casing stones that can create a smooth exterior. Um, and that actually is pretty uh, impressive too, right? The way that we can do this. But the maths are sort of fascinating. Um, they have to like wait, work out how to do this, right? And they're not quite sure of the right dimensions. They didn't like immediately figure out the perfect angles to come at. This pyramid was going up too steeply, so it was going to create something inherently unstable. So they changed the angle part way through. Okay. And just in order to continue the project and not stop after what they did, say, well, let's just see what it looks like if we like finish it at a slightly different angle. So they just changed it and then they continued. Um, and you end up with that. Which, I mean, it's cool looking, but it's definitely not ideal, right? But you can start to see how it would work. And this one here, some of the casing stones are still in place, many of the other ones are broken off and removed. Um, the pyramids, when they were all finished, they were all perfectly smooth. And they were always finished in different stones, so that when you have multiple ones at different sites, they would show, shine in the sun in different colors, because you're using a different type of stone on the outside. And the blocks, again, fit together so well that, um, as one ancient Greek um, uh, witness described it, you could drop a grain of sand from the top and it would bounce all the way down, not fall into a crack. You, like, you literally, you can't shove paper between the cracks. They just fit together so well. Make sense there? So they're really well done, but obviously, not immediately sure how to do the uh, geometry for that. So, the red pyramid is the first of works. It doesn't collapse, and it doesn't come out bent. One of the things that I think is sort of like fascinating about this is that all three of these first ones right, are all done by the same dude. So, having seen what, um, what Joseph and Imhotep had done with the step pyramid, Sneferu is like, dude, I like this. This is awesome. Let's come up with a better way to do it. And he has his architects work on one, and it collapses, and he has to work on another one, and it looks like crap. He says, I'm not going to be buried there. I'm not going to be buried there. Keep trying. And they built again. So one dude built three pyramids before he's finally had a place he was comfortable about being buried under it. Right? And that's the red pyramid, which, as you can see, the angles are right. right? This is actually perfect. All the casing stones are gone, so it shouldn't look like that. But um, it, it does actually have the proper dimensions. This is the first true pyramid. Um, and he's actually the first two, and many later pharaohs actually didn't even like this. There's a small chamber inside of it. It's pretty low down, but they actually had to shift some of the weight off of it and build a tiny room inside, a tiny little corridor that leads to it. It's really small because there's a lot of weight above it. All right? But they do actually manage to make a small corbel vaulted chamber where they can put his barrier inside. You know. Who he's got? Who's Okay. Um, Want to see the uh, the Great Pyramid? Because it, it's it's actually pretty amazing that the largest pyramid made comes immediately after they first figured out how to make a pyramid. So this guy's just like, just go for the gusto, man. Like, just keep going and make a massive one. And so that's so so Khufu comes along and wants this humongous pyramid made for himself. Um, Khufu is sometimes called Cheops, which comes from a, uh, a Greek version of his name. We'll call him Khufu, be polite. Um, and the Great Pyramid is huge. 
Um, and this thing is, for 4,000 years, the tallest man-made structure on the planet, which is a record that's not going to be beaten. Um, incidentally, I, I, I'm i in a couple of these pictures just as a joke because I think it's sort of funny. Um, I, for many years, when I take trips all across the country, all around the world, I don't take pictures of myself. So I would come back with like 10,000 pictures and people like, so where are you? And I'm taking the pictures, what are you talking about? Like, and it's all these like beautiful street scenes, people kind of like moving around and you know, neat little alleyways and cool bits of architecture and things that fascinate me. Um, so I finally agreed like you know, 10 years ago or so, whenever I go, I take a handful of pictures. And, yeah, just kind of for fun, so you know, a couple of them are kind of cute, so. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so we've got the Great Pyramid, right? Um, and then we have the next pharaoh in line, and people for a long time thought that Jeffrey didn't have a pyramid because we couldn't find one. This guy just not get one, and it played into certain stories that people could take an implication of. It wasn't clearly stated out, but in later histories, it sort of suggested there was a certain problem going on around here, and it kind of caught on. And people said, "Well, you know, maybe he like you know killed his brother and took the throne. He shouldn't have been one, so they decided not to give him a cool pyramid afterwards because he was like, a bad guy or something." Right? Turns out. He had a pyramid, and this is what's left of it. He didn't build it at Giza, he built it at Abu, what we call Abu Rabash today, but that's what's left of it. And it, it's simply been like torn apart later for, for stone. A lot of pyramids don't survive. They were simply dismantled later for building blocks for other projects much, much later. Right? Some of these things don't start happening until the, uh, the Arab Muslim period, actually. Right? But while it's been around for a long time, people have forgotten what, what, why it's important, we'll just take them apart. One of the reasons I think Jeffra is worth pointing to is that we find at his burial site the oldest sphinxes. What's a sphinx? It's like it's a cat. Yeah, it's like a cat with a human head, right? Um, so the Great Sphinx. The Great Sphinx is built on the Giza Plateau, right by the Great Pyramid, but it also it's not 10,000 years old, it wasn't built by aliens, it's also not super complex. It's literally carved out of the bedrock. This is a giant chunk of rock that was already here. And they just chipped away until they made the Great Sphinx. And we think now that it was actually built by the Jeffrey um, to honor his father, so that's probably Khufu's face originally on it. Uh, and it actually kind of like gets in the way of the construction of the next greatest pyramid, uh, Khafre's Pyramid, because Khafre's Pyramid is the only pyramid we have that has a diagonal causeway leading to it. Uh, it has to go around the Sphinx, so the Sphinx was there first. Does that make sense there? Uh, and they decided to come at it at an angle. So there's that. The pyramids themselves should not look like this. Um, Underneath, there are all these hewn blocks that are standing there, and don't climb on it, it's not a good idea. Um, but they're all just hewn blocks, and they would originally had those casing stones that fit under. You see the, the color of the stone here? These are actually some remainders of casing stones. Right? Just sort of like left there for a long time from when people used to tear them apart trying to do work, and now it's just part of the rubble around it. But this coloration would have been the whole thing, and it would have gone all the way up again, perfectly smooth, in this nice reddish color. So neat, right? Um, so here's, um, uh, we have Khufu's Pyramid and Khafre's Pyramid. And the road would lead up to that coming, coming at an angle because the Sphinx is here. Um, Khafre's Pyramid is the only one of the big ones to still have any of its casing stones. They went all the way to the top of the Great Pyramid to take them all off and reuse that stone. But they didn't quite get all this. It's got this cool little head on it. You can see it sticks out a bit more, a bit bigger, because the casing stone's on it. Right? And you can also see the color difference, can't you? That would have been its color all the way down, nice and bright. Um, it's badly worn because they were working at it, chipping and all the kind of stuff here, but um, that's that. Um, it's it, one of the interesting things we can see in the contemporary period how it just sort of conflicts with ancient accounts. Because when Greek and Roman authors were writing about these things, they were already thousands of years old. And Greek and Roman authors described them as perfectly smooth still. So they stayed in good shape for a very long time. Right? And only in the last couple thousand years they start showing significant damage and or deliberate destruction. Right? So who are so far? Um, now we do have a few smaller ones. 
present also on the Giza Plateau, but pyramids do get scattered around in a bunch of different places. Some of them go back later down to Saqqara, where the Step Pyramid is, and the Red Pyramid are. So a lot of the later pyramids are built closer to where the first pyramids were, um, because they fill up the Giza area. But you get the, the two giant ones there, and then you have, you have Mankara's uh, pyramid, and then a, a bunch of like smaller ones who are like scattered around here. So we do have, um, so, so Mankara's is here, the, the third one, and we end up with, um, and it's quite a lot smaller. It's a lot smaller, I mean, it's noticeably smaller if you put the three of them together, but it's also made out of granite, which they had a lot less of, so it's a much richer stone. So he chose a stone that was inherently more valuable more, and more difficult to work with, even though he's building something smaller. So cool there somewhere? So the only reason you know, it's going to be different doesn't necessarily mean he was a lousy king that he got a smaller pyramid. You know, it, he actually got a pretty rich pyramid. But this guy here actually went and built himself a mastaba. Well, this is after several generations of ever building pyramids. So he's going for like a retro look. Right? Once like, you know, you know, this is what we did in the old days. Right? Uh, but after him, it went back to pyramids. And it stays pyramids for almost every ruler of the old kingdom. But it's really only an old kingdom issue. It's going to change dramatically as we move into the, uh, the middle and new kingdom periods. A whole bunch of different types of burials will show up from that point on. But pyramids are quite important um, you know, early on here. So, you guys want to talk about the afterlife? Yeah. A little bit of myth in here. Uh, again, this is sort of restricted to a particular location which is why the environment inside the tomb is super important. And they all have texts on the walls in hieroglyphs. And those pyramid texts are important because they contain a story and a series of rituals, a series of prayers. If, as long as those prayers are there, as long as that text is perfect and with you, then you have access to the afterlife. If you're buried without those words, you don't. And it has to tell a particular story. So I'll just take a second, give you know, the short, short version of the story. Um, we have a lot of the twists and detours in it, but we'll, um, we might you know, find another different day, make a few other points about it. The, uh, so you have, um, this part of like uh, Osiris, or Osiris. So, um, Osiris, and then we often use um, Isis or Isis for his wife, but the, um, but the comedic word would be actually Ist, his wife is Ist. So Osiris and Ist, right? Or Osiris and Isis, if you want to make it the you know, way we tend to. Go there somewhere? So we got, they are siblings and spouses. Go so far? Osiris has an evil brother, Set, who really wants to kill him and tries over and over again to kill him. And every time, his, uh, his wife manages to track his body down and then save him just in the nick of time. Right. And some of them are actually quite, quite fantastic. Once he's like actually entombed inside a tree that gets used as a pillar in a, in a, in a temple all the way up in Phoenicia, and she has to go all the way up there and like take this pillar out without collapsing the building or breaking out. Anyways, whatever. But she's always, you know, getting his butt out, 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 of, out, of the, uh, out of the fire, right? So Seth gets tired of this and says, you know, I, I'm really, I, I'm just making sure this never comes back. And he like goes full on Texas Chainsaw Massacre on his brother and chops him up into little tiny pieces and throws the pieces all over the place. He's like going all over the world, like tossing pieces here and there. And she still is determined to save her husband. So she goes and she collects all the pieces. Now she doesn't get all of them because um, this got thrown into the Nile and was devoured by three fish. So she has to put him back together with a, a wooden phallus. Um, and this, this is a whole different story to that we can talk about much later in the class. It had, that has certain consequences. But the one to point to here that involves the, uh, the afterlife is that it actually is an explanation for why when you mummify, when you pre prepare for burial, the bodies have to be whole. So if you lost an arm in battle, you're a soldier, right? You lost an arm in battle, and you're a retired soldier, whatever, you die 20 years later, and they go to bury you, they're going to make a wooden arm and just tack it on there. It's, it's not going to look great. It's not going to be functional. It's just it's a you know, crappy little wooden arm, but it just it fills out the body. Make sure that when they do the mummification, every part of the body is there. Make sense? It has to be there in order for the afterlife to be open to you. And the afterlife is open to you because of what happens to Osiris. She puts his body back together and magically resurrects him. This is why Osiris is always depicted in green. He's literally like the zombie god. Right? Um, and because he was resurrected from the dead, he then uh, becomes the guardian of the underworld. He was of the underworld. So cool there, right? 
So as long as I have the burial done the right way, as long as we have somebody who has properly mummified and the pyramid texts are present, then they have access to the underworld. We can pass through and, and, uh, and, and meet Osiris and all that business. Cool? Does that make sense as a story? So, this is this here. But it's for the rulers early on. And you all have to have a temple there, and people have to continue to say those prayers in order to keep the, the Pharaoh's spirit alive, in order to keep his, his bah or his ka alive. Cool? Um, and that kind of like maintains his afterlife in death.